This is Kevin in New York. Welcome to the show. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, hey, hey, you guys. Um, I'd really like to bring up a uh, a debate about morality and suffering. Uh huh. Um, well, all right. Well, um, I think it can be summed up uh, pretty simply when thinking about morality, uh, like. The concept of morality is purely subjective, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So we might have an individual perspective in the quantity of how many people there are, uh, a possible 7 billion subjective moralities. <laughs> um, but when discussing the subject, uh, it can be intuitive to bring up uh, a child, for example, and, and their relationship to morality. Because... Mm-hmm. Because, like, um, a child, of course, cannot know right from wrong. But the important point is, is that the child, in the process of growing, comes to recognize the authority over it, and thereby adopt, uh, adopting um, the subject of morality. I, I would disagree with that a little bit. I would push back against that a little bit. Uh, because yeah. at least... In some of my own experiences, uh, some of the kids I have been around who are growing up, who are learning about morality, uh, some of them are basically just taught, you know, this is bad because I said so. But there are also kids that are t- that are learning about morality by finding out what consequences are, you know, like you know, if I do this to you, doesn't that hurt? Don't you not want that to happen? Why would you do that to somebody else? They'll feel that way too. So you don't want to do this because you know it feels bad when it happens to you. So you wouldn't want to do that to somebody else. So I guess, uh, and I guess that is technically still subjective in that what you may or may not want to happen to you might be subjective, but I guess I... I would say it's definitely not a hundred percent based based on authority figures. Right, and we're also social animals, so it's not you know several billion independent views on or subjective views on what morality is. There's also what uh, society thinks is is moral as well, and that society can be as as big as your local city, it can be as big as the country. Uh, size the, like the United States or, or as, as small as Vermont. Um, and it can be the entire world. We decide as a group what is acceptable. And I think a lot of that is because we are a social species that it's based on cooperation and recognizing when, you know, uh, w- when cooperation is good and when it, it's bad. I, w- I would agree that, that most babies in many ways are selfish in that they're completely focused on them, but that until they start realizing there's a world and people and other things out there, and then uh, kind of going on from there, building building that out. Um, and I kind of agree with you with authority as well, because that's kind of what parents and, and adults are in many ways, are authority figures. Um, well, yeah. But um, also, we're also social species and that's how we learn as well. So yeah, babies have to be taught almost everything um from the beginning and i agree with you that that it is it is somewhat subjective um but once you have the subjective standard set then you can see you can set um objective goals um to improve things as well so it can be both but the initial subjective of what we're going to call good and bad is definitely subjective but the way we can measure how we're moving towards better and improving things um, can be done objectively. So I think it's a, it's a more of a mix than anything else. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. That, that's why it's important to point out uh, that uh, within a child, the concept of morality can never be concrete. Um, it, it, it's, it's just that process of growing, and, and it really comes down to whether that child will recognize if that's a good authority or not, you know what I mean? As they, as they, uh, progress into the other stages of life. Okay. What, what uh, is the, what is the uh, point you're trying that. to make? Well, me and myself as a theist, 
Um, the reason why I, I bring up the subject of uh, morality and, and suffering is because, um, say, uh, Jesus, for example, as many people would just consider him as a teacher, um, the reason why it's convincing for me is because not only did he seem as a teacher, but as an authority on subjects such as uh, morality and suffering. What made what? him an authority on those things, as opposed to like anybody else who had anything to say about what's right or wrong or what you should or shouldn't do? Well, uh, one of well, uh, uh, concentrating on what I was calling about, like for example, the reason why he seemed like an authority is because, like uh, for say, the uh, topic of suffering. Um, the key to it is really endurance because uh, it was once said that um, I, 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 I want to stop you right there a little bit. Are you saying that people yeah. need to put up with suffering? Um, just as a general rule and that's just a good moral Uh, up until the point that it it's um, up until the point where it can only become life threatening should a person endure suffering. But isn't that even better? Because when you die, you go to heaven, and if you suffer enough, you go to heaven. Yeah, I also don't remember no, Jesus not, saying anything about any exceptions about well, except when it's life threatening. I think that that's an interpretation. But even besides that, I mean, I can think of lots of instances where suffering is absolutely needless. Like, if you can do something about it, if you can make the suffering stop, why wouldn't you? If you're observing somebody else's suffering or your own suffering, I, I mean, I mean, there's there's so many instances that I could think of where it, it would not make sense, where enduring suffering is, I mean, enduring suffering is good i guess in s certain circumstances but i certainly wouldn't use that as a general rule i might use it if you know i'm at work and my coworker says something kind of shitty but i just have to get back to what i'm doing and bite my tongue and move on right. maybe i would use it then but if you've got a debilitating illness um anything along those lines yeah i mean if yeah, there's an illness that can't be cured you, ha you you have to do it but uh, and I mean, Jesus never really went back and fixed some of the severe problems with the Bible. Um, things like thought crimes, uh, coveting your neighbor's uh, wife is a thought I crime. That, um, well, um, I, I want to remind everyone listening that even though I'm a theist, uh, not only do I read the Bible, but apocryphal texts, I won't talk about that. But um, I'm, I'm really going to concentrate on what we're talking about. But the really important thing to point out is that if the Adam and Eve story is true, then something that is constantly overlooked is that the result of that story is that Satan became our God all the way up until the, well, time of the suffering of Jesus. Uh, yeah, there's, that doesn't follow. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't follow. But anyway, could, but, but you, you didn't address my point, which but, is that he, he doesn't address one of these things that is really, really key, which is thought crimes. Um, he doesn't address slavery. He doesn't address uh, women as essentially property. Um, he doesn't address any of these problems that the, the Old Testament brings up. And he actually exacerbates some of these as well. So I don't know. He had some good things to say, but yeah, I mean, I could say the same thing of Hitler. I could say the same thing of Mussolini. I can say the same thing as Jim Jones, David Karash. Yeah, um, he had good ideas and bad ideas, and I don't really see him as different from anybody else who has good ideas and bad ideas. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we have a situation of uh, all the way up from the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Jesus' suffering a situation in which God was uh, trying to withdraw us from the operation of the curse, which is uh, death. 
Now, the well, reason, why couldn't well, he so, just do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, this whole thing of of the 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 debt or the blood, whatever you want to call it is also problematic because God created the rules. He created people, not he created creatures, humans that weren't able to follow the rules. He did this with, with full foreknowledge of what was going to happen next. Um, and so, if you really mm -hmm. wanted to get perverse, you could say that God set up the entire situation just so that he could kill his own kid. And that is not an unreasonable thing to claim when he knew what the rule, he, he created the rules, he created the people who couldn't follow them and he knew what, what the result would be, right? Um, and so I really have a problem with people who say, well, you know, there was some sort of blood debt that, he, that Christ had to pay because of, of sins put on by a man. Um, it's, it's, well, it's yeah. problematic. Um, th things like something that you brought up before, like, um, say, the concept of slavery. I think that that's, that is indeed answered because when you when you read texts, not just from the Bible, but apocryphal texts. Uh, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, Jesus, Kevin, but I, I that, feel like you're that, not really addressing the concerns oh. that we brought up. I feel like you're kind of bouncing oh, around a little bit. Oh, oh no, um, it, this this really does have to do with uh, what you guys are talking about because okay. um, I, I know all of this is subjective, like like say what Jim was saying about uh, Hitler and and these other figures in which we have examples of the worst things humans can do. But even from their perspective, say Hitler, the, his uh, subjective morality was was just that it was subjective morality because he thought he was doing something good and it, he thought that the killing of Jews was a, uh, a, a thing of, um, it had to do with hygiene. Yeah. But kind of like Jim brought up earlier, we do him. have, we have our individual subjective moralities, but we also have societal morality and all of society pretty much except for a small group of people who are still into those ideals have fully condemned those actions as a society we've all agreed that that wasn't good right and i would say that our that society as a whole worldwide society since the time of christ has gotten better and we've gotten more ethical as time has gone by not because of the christian church or any other church for that matter but despite some of their best efforts um, and we continue to move forward. The church is consistently on the wrong side of things. Um, and, and I say the church in the most general sense, the Christian church especially, they're on the wrong side of the LGBTQIA problem. There are issues. There are, I don't want to say problem. I, uh, but anyway, the trans, trans <laughs> issues, <you> <laughs> <laughs> they're, on, they're on the wrong side of every social issue we can think of right now. Um, and they'll continue to be on the wrong side because they have this book of absolute, capital T truth that is made up of mostly BS and bad stuff. And so, yeah, you can say it's subjective all, all you want, but ethically this society right now worldwide is better than it was 2000 years ago. And in 2000 years, we will be better provided religion does not take over. I have doubts that um, even in our current state, it can reach a point in terms of subjective reality to where it, it can become uh, sustainable. Uh, Why? What, what makes you say that? Because we're, 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 too, we're too much subjected to the pressures of everyday living to come to a point to where we collectively uh, show what, the, what, um, what is the best that we can do in terms of mankind. I but we're, I strongly we're... disagree. I mean, did you miss yeah. 2020? Did you miss, you know, protests worldwide of people who interrupted their own everyday lives to make a moral stand? And I you... mean, people are doing that every day, all the time. If it's just a post on Facebook to say, I disagree with this, or saying to a coworker, hey, that was kind of racist, or yeah. like, whatever. If it's a big thing or a small thing, we literally do this every single day. I don't know how you can say that people are too bogged down in their everyday lives to yeah, and make a that, difference or care. And that point itself, that we're too well, bogged down in our everyday I, lives, I is, is also 
that's also incorrect because we now have two days a week that most of us take off, right? Whether it's Saturday and Sunday or not is completely dependent on your work schedule. But we have in general more free time today than we did 100 years ago or 2000 years ago when you were working from dusk until dawn just to put food on your own table, right? And now I can order, you know, groceries once or twice or three times a week or every day of the week or twice a day uh, and have them delivered and never step outside of my own house and never stop doing things that I do. In free time, people having free time is one of the keys to people thinking about ethical problems. And we can see this, you know, when Greece was in its heyday, so when we got all of our, our Western philosophers, um, same with Rome. When Rome fell, people stopped being, having the free time. We stopped having the ability to have people devote their entire lives to studying something as frivolous as ethics or as frivolous as what, what is beauty or doing art or making new things. So I, d- I just don't see any way, not only with what Rudy said, but with what I just pointed out, that you're even in the same galaxy as right. Uh, w- one more thing, uh, I'd like to hear what you guys think about this because this is the reason why I, in my mind, uh, try tried to assert that uh, figures like Jesus is in authority on all this because it was once said that it is the desire uh, that the lesser things be made the greater at the end of the age through the power of God. So what? And so yeah. I, think that- <laughs> I, I literally, I, I'm sorry, I have, I have absolutely zero care for that statement whatsoever. It's like, okay, and yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody saying something doesn't necessarily have, yeah, that, that doesn't really have any sway. And I guess my question is, do you understand why that doesn't matter at all to us? Well, that that's... Uh... I'm trying to make it understandable on why I even brought up uh, on why a person should endure suffering. I don't think anybody should have to endure suffering. I mean, we should do everything in our power I mean, to alleviate ourselves from suffering. Well, yes, but I mean, I mean, ultimately, I, I'm looking at the the ultimate result of of all this. I mean, what is it? What is the ultimate result of all this? What is the ultimate result of suffering? Well, that that we ha- we all have to die one day, but I seriously don't think that our existence ends with with death. And your well, evidence of that is that, what? Um, I, I I think that you're also saying that uh, suffering is inevitable and death is inevitable. There's a lot of other things that are inevitable too that aren't suffering and death. You know, uh, tax day coming is inevitable. Well, well, another another example on how uh, jesus speaks as an authority instead of a teacher is that it was also said that um once we see how much of the world was before us and after us we would see that our life was only but a single day and our sufferings a single hour you don't think any other philosophers ever said anything like that yeah um i i can think of several off the top of my head that have said exactly the same thing (laughs) I mean, you keep, you keep bringing up Jesus as this authority, and I'm like, well, I, I don't care. I mean, you haven't proven that he's anything more or less than any other human uh, teacher in his own time. He was saying things that were pretty radical, but today they're actually, you know, we have moved ethically belong, beyond anything that he has said. Yeah. We have and it, I think that an even greater point here is even if Jesus did come up with some totally original philosophical or moral concept, what does that prove? Like he came up with something, so what? Somebody had to be the first to say something, you know? Uh, assuming he was. For some reason in yeah. all this, for some reason in all this, it seems like uh, free will is is important to God as, as well as his other uh, laws that he lays out for us. Um, well, I, I would disagree that, that your, your that God cares about free will. I, he doesn't care about free will. Yeah, did you read the story of Moses when God repeatedly makes Pharaoh's heart hardened so that he does not have a choice but to send Moses away and then his lands are plagued and his kid is killed, etc., etc.? Yeah. 
and the um, uh, okay. believe love me then love me or die is not about free will either. You know, love me or burn in hell forever uh, is not about free will either, right? That is about control. Hmm. Well, uh, I don't think that questioning God really brings about any condemnation. And I even have questions within myself whether uh, the concept of hell is even eternal. Uh, well, you're going to have to deal because... with the other Christians on that one. Because when you Christians come up with something that is actually capital T truth, then I'm much more willing to talk to Christians about what they believe. Mm -hmm. But when there are 2,000 different denominations all getting their uh dogma from the same book and they are diametrically opposed and you know th these dogmas cannot exist all at the same time then uh i'm sorry i just i don't care what your book says um any more than i read any other book and so as far as ethics go we are far beyond it um you're right it is subjective um you can choose to go with divine command theory which is what you're doing when you say that jesus is the authority and you'll do whatever jesus says is ethical but I, for one, I'm going to look at every situation uh, differently, and I'm going to apply empathy and uh, care for my fellow human being as much as I am humanly capable of doing in every situation and use that as my guiding light, as opposed to some guy who lived 2,000 years ago. Yeah. This was this was an enjoyable conversation, yeah. Kevin, yeah. and I would love to uh, I would love for you to call back sometime, but we do need to move on to other callers. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. It, it was a good conversation. Thank you. Have a nice yep. day. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. All right. And I think we have some folks to thank at the moment, some patrons of the week. Our top five patrons are <laughs> uh, <laughs> Eric Tweet, CJ Dennis, Dingleberry Jackson, Desert Heathen, and Bethany P. Thank you guys for supporting the show and for supporting the ACA. You guys rock. We do appreciate it. It helps us uh, keep the lights on and keep the internet bill paid, which are both important things <laughs> when you're doing an internet show. Um, but yes, thank you guys. And thank you folks in chat who are also super chatting and, and donating there as well. We greatly appreciate it.